really envision and build a more just and equitable future. So these are the questions, the struggles, the conundrums that are really at the core of what makes Edry, Edry. And spoiler alert, we're not going to solve everything in this short panel, but we want to prevent, present some provocations and lenses from which we can approach some of these really meaty challenges. And we're super fortunate today to be joined by three brilliant speakers who have shown leadership, resilience, and vision in driving change in their respective areas. So without further ado, I want to jump right into the discussion. And I'd like to start with Fanny. So on the big tech and power front, how do you think we're doing in holding large companies and state actors to account for their impact on human rights and democracy? Uh, I, I was looking at Gus to steal his move on these chairs. It's, it's, it's strange. Um, so, well, uh, we still live in uh, neoliberal capitalism. So if you put that as a threshold to challenge as a, as a measure of impact and success, then we're not doing too well. Um, I, I think that maintaining the distinction between state actors and private sector doesn't get us too far and we should look at their impact instead as their function and powers are so intertwined. And instead of looking at that impact, uh, there's an alarming trend of a risk-based approach to digital policies from one legislative file to another, from one industry lobbyist to a commission official, from the European Union to the United States and so forth. Uh, when, when we talk about risks that relativizes harms and violation and it centers processes, documentation, transparency measures, so minimal compliance and mitigation at the center. And there are use cases of technology that are incompatible with human rights and they should not exist in Europe and globally for that matter. Um, so we should ground digital policies in rights and not risks. Well said and very true. Thank you, Fanny. These are really important dynamics to keep in mind for past legislation, current, and the next tsunami of EU law. I want to turn now to the government side of things and reflect on the policymaking piece. So we all know, we people in this room know painfully well how long and complex the EU legislative process can be, but the role of political will can often drastically impact the timeline. And so, Birgit, I want to ask you, especially given your involvement and leadership in things like the e-evidence regulation and the e-privacy regulation, do you see sometimes, or have you seen, a discrepancy between political will for laws that may undermine fundamental rights versus those that are intended to protect or expand fundamental rights? Um, I started to laugh a little bit because uh, listening to your question, I think we all already know the answer. So, uh, yes, there is an impact. And to be honest, I was so happy to hear the colleagues in the first round talking about difficult and sometimes boring things and repeating things to make progress. And that's also something that we see in Parliament, in Council, and... Today we are celebrating 20 years of IDRI, but I sometimes still have the impression either many of the actors working on it do not understand what it means to live in ever more digitized environments, or they are simply not interested in because they want to ignore our digital, our fundamental rights. And clearly you see it on e-evidence, for example, there was much pressure, we need to work on it, we need it, we need to have access to digital data, to digital information because of law enforcement. And we just heard about the full number of other things that are on the table. We have the Digital Market Act, the Digital Service Act, we have the Data Act, we now have the European Health Data Act. Have you seen that we are now always talking about acts? 
I'm not sure if this is linked to we want to go the American style, because they are talking about acts. But with all these pieces of legislation, sometimes there is the impression we do forget about the, oh, we call it the golden standard of data protection on GDPR. But with all these pieces, and you mentioned it already, uh, there are different actors because these files are not all negotiated in LIBE where we know about the importance of protecting fundamental rights. They are in ENVI, in ITRA, in IMCO, so we are talking with actors on industry, internal market, environment. So uh, we really have to be careful checking that the standards we just created are not undermined. And coming back to a privacy, you know Parliament has a position on an e privacy regulation protecting confidentiality of communication, which is in ever more digitized worlds, I don't need to explain it to you all here in the room, it's ever more important, more important than ever to protect confidentiality of communication, all kinds of communication. So Parliament has a position since 2017, Council has a position since 2021. And I can tell you what's going on right now to make progress. Nothing. <laughs> so we meet with the different presidencies and currently the reaction from the presidencies is, uh-huh, interesting, okay. Because everything else is more important than e-privacy. And it's not only that there is an interest, an imbalance between law enforcement on the one hand and protecting personal data communication on the other hand. It's even getting worse with all the interests of industry. And if I may do a final um, statement, I really feel harassed and I can't bear it any longer to say, Oh, but uh, data are the new oil, we need to make progress, our industry needs it. Hmm. And then we ignore digital rights. And so, uh, and it's not true. We even hear, oh, with data protection, we are hindering progress. We are hindering things are going on. We are hindering that our industry will continue. That's not true, it's bullshit. To be honest, if we want to have <laughs> if we want to have real progress in this digitized area and want to make a difference, not only to China, partly also to the United States and some private big companies that are working, you have to organize all these digital things in combination with protecting data, protecting privacy, protecting our individual rights. This is possible, and it's not a magic thing. You simply have to start working on it, and I'm really happy to see so many people here in the room who are supporting these views, and I hope you really can restart working on it, even on e-privacy, putting some pressure on the council, saying you also, not only parliament, you also have to do things in the best interests of your citizens. You have to protect the rights of citizens. And I hope all together we can make a difference to make e privacy finally come back to life. Woo! Thank you, Birgit. And I can, I would put money on the fact that there are some people in this room that will never stop fighting for the e-privacy regulation. <laughs> so <laughs> we have your back on that. Um, Kim, I want to turn to you now. Um, when we talk about things like AI, there's often a lot of focus on the technology itself, even hype, you might want to call it. And there's a lot of minimization of the role that humans play. Um, the impact, the societal impacts that they can have, but also the hidden labor behind these systems. So I'd like to ask you, how can we ensure that conversations around AI and, and technology center around the human impact, and particularly those who are most impacted? So thank you very much, and congratulations. Um, yeah, I think um, what we're currently seeing is that um, we don't put human value over market value. 
Market value is at the core of all the initiatives. It's important that we are competitive, that we are uh, promoting the best environment for all these companies to flourish in. Um, and whether that might accidentally, you know, affect a person, um, that is uh, that is then, yeah, just you know, collateral damage. That's a bit the, the point of view that you're seeing. Um, and I think also that's the point of view that these big tech companies are bringing towards the parliament. And um, now seeing seeing you all here today, which is which is really nice. I've, I know so many of your faces, but I've never seen you all together. Realizing also that you're not that big a group. And you're going against 100 million euros a year from these big tech companies. I would say, well done, well done, you know, like well done for fighting for digital rights in this atmosphere. Um, when it comes to, to, for example, the AI Act, and when it comes to s putting um, human value at the center of the AI Act and human rights at the at the center of the AI Act, I mean that was the promise of the AI Act. But indeed, it became a risk-based approach. And it became something where um, we were also looking at human rights. Um, and um, even at, at the start of the negotiations in the parliament, there was a fundamental discussion of the goal of the AI Act. Was it there to protect fundamental rights? Or was it actually there to promote technology and to promote AI businesses in Europe? So I think it's very, very uh, amazing to see that also because of the different uh, campaigns that that Edry put forward together with the with the broader coalitions, for example, against biometric surveillance, uh, but also um, uh, the work that we done together uh, to make sure we now have a fundamental rights impact probably in the position of the parliament. Um, you know, that is something that, that we really have to, to stand for and to make sure that indeed people are at the core of these legislations. But also when it comes to the Platform Work Directive, um, one of the biggest fights that, that people knew about in the Platform Work Directive was, of course, um, the status, the employment status of the worker, whether they are a worker or not. But the other part was all about making sure we preserve fundamental rights when you are in a work environment, um, when, you are, uh, when, you, when an algorithm is your manager. How do we make sure that there's still a human approach to that, a humane approach, that we make sure that if you have a terrible accident and might even die on the job, there's not an email coming towards you that says, oh, sorry, you didn't deliver the food, now you're fired. This is what literally happens. And now we are finally at a point where we're recognizing that these rights should be there um, also for the people. And I think, indeed, when we're talking now a lot about technology, about chat GPT, this is the future, blah, blah, blah. Um, there we're also not looking at the human value. The thousands and thousands of click workers that had to read through the whole internet and all the data that had to be put into ChatGPT before it could even be a sort of reliable system um, and, and the toll that is taken on them and, and the, like the cents per click that they're getting and the traumas that they are having. I think that is one of the, the next things we have to focus on. So keeping people centered is also by looking at people, don't be bedazzled by the technology. Look at the impact it has on people. Make sure that technologies that are uh, proposed by um, uh, governments, so, uh, such as um, uh, algorithms that are ch uh, checking whether you're fraudulent, that they have to go to a fundamental rights um, uh, impact assessment, or actually these ones should be banned, but the other ones <laughs> that uh, that they at least go to a fundamental rights impact assessment, that workers have to have decent rights even though a technology is their manager and when it comes to, to the people working behind the systems that they also have the fundamental rights they deserve. Well said, thank you. <laughs> and we're almost closing our time, but before we do a, a last sort of closing thought, I want to ask you, Fanny, in what Birgit and Kim have described, what do you see as Edry's role? Well, I, I, my answer is I, d I don't think that you might agree with me on this uh, because there's a traditional answer, but uh, I come from Hungary, there's no proper opposition, and my, f my vision for EDRI and our movement more broadly is much more political than, than we are operating in as, as NGOs. Uh, I would like to see us as mayors of our hometowns. I would like to see us in the European and other parliaments. I would like to see us as executive vice president of the European Commission for Digital. Um, 
Yeah, so so I think we need to go beyond our boundaries and be a hub and nurture different processes and, and people to be in power. Thank you. It's important to stay positive and to have this positive, ambitious vision. I think a lot of us in the room feel that you know the, the work that we do, um, it can be disheartening and hard because the problems are systemic and the interests are powerful and technology is not gonna save us. So um, crucial to keep us going the last 20 and the next 20 is to really have a bold and radical vision for the future that we want to build together. So in closing, I would like to ask each of you in one sentence to, <laughs> that's the challenge, in one sentence tell me what is one thing that we can do individually or collectively, big or small, to support a more um, equitable, just, and human-centered future. And Birgit, I want to start with you. Am I allowed to do one sentence with a lot of commas in between? <laughs> <laughs> Two footnotes. <laughs> um, now, I think what we individually can do is to be aware that uh, whenever you are faced with one or the other digital service, stay critical. What's the hidden message? What is the working taking place behind the scene? So who is offering something? Who is making profit from it? That's important. And for that, I think we need more education for everybody. Because even some of the so-called digital native are not knowing, not aware what's happening behind the scene. So that's the one point. And <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I think I very like, like very much what Fanny said, we should be the ones to take the decisions. Until we are there, at least we have to ask the Commission to make proposals that are coherent, that do respect what already is on the table. And once they do it, as guardians of the treaty, we have to push even the Commission that they push the member states, that they please do what we are looking for for every single citizen, implement, enforce, and respect the laws that they have decided. So these are the two angles I wanted to mention in a very long sentence, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Fanny? Um, so no matter how much we are committed to the European project, the EU institutions don't serve people, um, and, or at least not equally. And even the legal mechanisms that should protect our rights don't necessarily do that equally in, in society. And so I would like to see a much stronger competence and new constitutional foundation for human rights uh, for the EU after a reform. It still uh, baffles me that after Brexit we are sitting here and there was absolutely no reflection on what we did wrong other than blaming a propaganda campaign. Um, and so I think first we need to enforce the charter, but frankly we need to see beyond the charter and this is not protecting everyone. So I, I think we need a new legal basis that goes beyond some kind of weird combination of data protection and the internal market uh, to try to capture all of these human rights challenges in the digital age. Thank you. Kim? Yeah, since I was asked to be, be radical, um, uh, and I like banning things because I'm a green, um, I think we should, like looking at the current state of our democracy, we have to ban polarizing algorithms based on clicks and interaction. I think we can no longer have any excuse to say that um, the active spread of online hate and disinformation uh, to the extent that is happening right now is tolerable in any way. Um, so we just have to, we have to ban it. Th that's it. Well said. Um, that brings us to the end. Thank you so much to the panelists for your insightful contributions, for your leadership, and for everyone on this stage and off this stage. Thank you so much for everything that you do to support 
a better future and the digital rights movement.